It's the Philosophical Inquiry Show! Tonight's episode, Aristotle on Life. So, last time I told you that Aristotle thinks the universe of substances is a universe of substances made up of matter and form. And how do we distinguish different kinds of substances? By their matter. Uh, no, 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 no. By their form. You can't distinguish things according, kinds of things according to their matter, because at the material level, everything looks the same. At the level of quantum physics, it all is quarks, electrons, subatomic particles, and these things called strings. Okay, so the distinction between kinds of things rests in form. Aristotle thinks in some ways the universe is like a giant cafeteria kitchen. You go back into the kitchen of a cafeteria and you see the different stations, the different tables where they make the food. And you might see the tables, the stations, um, um, separated according to the type of cuisine. So, at one table you have rice, tortillas, beans. That's the Tex-Mex station. At another table, you have dough, marinara sauce, and mozzarella cheese. That's the Italian station. And yet another station is the salt, fat, sugar. That's the Americana station. So that's just matter, right? At, say, the Italian station and the Tex-Mex station, it's, it's just matter, right? Let's just focus on the Italian station, right? There's dough, sauce, cheese. You can't eat dough, sauce, and cheese, right? Blech. Imagine you just took a clump of dough and then drank the sauce, stuffed some cheese in your mouth. No, won't work. The matter is useless. Indeed, Aristotle thinks matter on its own is useless. Matter is nothing, literally, until it's formed to be something. Just like the dough, the sauce, and the cheese isn't food until it's organized into food. Same with matter. Same with the, all the quarks, the electrons, strings, whatever. Aristotle, who didn't know about quarks, but he realized that at the material level it has to be the same. Uh, it has to look like that. Uh, at the material level, right, we're, it's just, there's nothing there. It has to be organized into something. Well... The Italian station, you can take the dough, the sauce, and the cheese. You can organize it into what? A calzone, a pizza, lasagna, right? The calzone, the pizza, the lasagna all have exactly the same matter. It's just dough, sauce, cheese. Why didn't you order pizza when you wanted a calzone? Why did you order a calzone if you didn't want lasagna? Because they are really different. Form really makes matter into different kinds of substances. Okay, I'll say that again. Form really does separate the material universe into different kinds of substance. And Aristotle thought that at the most basic level of how those substances get distinguished, he thinks matter is sometimes formed into inanimate substances, like rocks, like volcanoes, perhaps, certainly like rocks, like elements, like the elements on the periodic table. Those are all inanimate substances. But sometimes our material world is formed, organized, into animate substances. <clears throat> we call such substances living. How did Aristotle define life? <clears throat> life, according to Aristotle, is a substance capable of its own activity. A living substance for Aristotle is a substance formed, organized, to carry out its own activity. This bottle cap. This bottle cap is an inanimate substance. It has no activity unto itself. It only does what it's made to do. If I let it go, it drops. If 
I toss it, it obeys all the laws of physics, right? You could, you could calculate, you could predict everything this bottle cap will do once you know its physical properties. But Aristotle noticed that there's some substances that just have their own thing, their own stuff that they do. Living things are like this. Aristotle noticed that living things are distinguished into still further uh, um, kinds of living things. So what is the form of all living things, right? Remember, form is how we distinguish things. Form is how we distinguish things. You distinguish this kind of dough sauce cheese from that kind of dough sauce cheese based on how it's formed. This dough sauce cheese is formed as pizza. This dough sauce cheese is formed as lasagna. Same thing in the natural world. Some matter is formed inanimately. Some matter is formed animately, livingly, to have life. That most basic form, the form of all living things, Aristotle called suke. He didn't call it that, actually. It's just the Greek word for it, suke. Uh, P-S-U-C-H-E, suke. Um, in Latin, it got translated anima. That's where we get animate from. And I must tell you how it usually gets translated in English with a four-letter word, S-O-U-L, soul. The soul. And Aristotle is talking about the soul. Soul, this is a definition, just a very basic definition. It'll be on a test probably. Aristotle's definition of soul is soul is the form of living things. If you told Aristotle you don't believe in the soul, you've told Aristotle you don't think there's a difference between living things and inanimate things. And if you say that, I just don't know what to say back to you. What do you mean you don't think there's a distinction between animate and inanimate things? There, there, there's clearly a difference between Mr. Whiskers, my cat, and a, a rock that never does anything. So, suke, soul, that's the form of all living things. And Aristotle's happy to write, in, 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 at least the way it gets translated, Aristotle's happy to write that plants, animals, and people have soul. They're solid kind of things. But notice for Aristotle, this is the most um, natural thing in the world to say. This is just to say that all living things are animated, animad, sukate, solid. To say you're solid is just to say you're a living thing. It's just to say that your matter is organized to have its own operations, its own activity. It's not purely governed by the laws that govern the elements on the periodic table. Well, what kinds of activities do living things have? At the most basic level, a living thing is capable of taking in nutrition and reproducing. That's the most basic kind of life. You grow and reproduce. And Aristotle said that is the vegetative suke. They call it the vegetative soul. Plants have vegetable souls. Now, I hope you're noticing that Aristotle is not talking about soul the way you might expect him to, if you've been watching American cartoons, okay? The soul, the way we're talking about it, it's not a ghost that's moving around in a body. Plants don't have some sort of invisible, like, ghost plants moving them. No, when we talk about the vegetable soul, we're simply talking about the way that some matter gets organized to grow and reproduce. Some matter is organized into a substance that grows and reproduces. Plants, vegetables, trees, flowers, that kind of thing. We call that vegetable soul. They're formed to do vegetable things. That's all. I mean, this is not spooky. This isn't even metaphysics, Aristotle thinks. Aristotle thinks that when he's doing this, he's still doing a kind of straight-up physics. He was doing metaphysics when he brought form into it, sure. But when he starts describing how form works in different things, he's back to doing physics, right? He's observed, I mean, this is the most straightforward observation. Plants grow and reproduce. That's the most basic kind of life there is. That's what they're formed to do. And since we call the form of living things soul or anima or suke, right, that's the kind of soul they have. They have a kind of soul which allows them to grow and reproduce. Some things, in addition to growing and reproducing, are also capable of somehow sensing the world around them. 
How they do that, we leave that up to, to the physical sciences, right? But there are some things with um, sensory capacities, the ability to perceive the world around them. With that ability, with the ability to perceive, always comes, thinks Aristotle, the ability to um, have local, locomotive motion, to move through space, to be able to move through space. Aristotle, you know, he just thinks it would, it would just be awful, just be terrible to find out that vegetables had sense and perception, right? Imagine if, imagine if the grass could see the lawnmower coming towards it. Oh, no, there's nothing we can do. Ah! No, you know, Aristotle, Aristotle recognizes that um, nature always endows things that can perceive danger with the ability to escape danger. So animals don't have vegetable souls. Animals have what um, Aristotle sometimes calls a locomotive soul or a sensitive soul. Sensitive meaning capable of sensing, capable of sensing the world around them. <laughs> so there's two kinds of life. There's two kinds of ways animate substances are organized or solid. Some are organized just to grow and reproduce. Some are organized in such a way that in addition to growing and reproducing, they have a sense capacity and thereby an ability to move through the world physically. Those animals whose um, soul limits them to locomotion and sensation, in philosophical speak, we call brutes, brute animals. A brute animal includes a bear, a pig, a fly, a mollusk, you name it. Basically, all the animals other than us. Aristotle thinks there's one very interesting kind of animal, the human animal. Aristotle says it's the rational animal, the animal that, in addition to sensing, perceiving, running, moving through space, actually takes space in, takes the universe in, and tries to categorically, systematically, scientifically understand it. The rational animal, the human being. Your matter is organized in such a way that it doesn't just grow and reproduce. Your matter is organized in such a way that it's not just restricted to a life activity that lets it run away from danger and run towards pleasure. Rather, your matter is organized in such a way that you're able to science the universe. You're able to understand everything around you. Your mind takes the universe in and organizes it. The 20th century scientist Carl Sagan um, once said that you, you, a human being, you're just the universe reflecting back on itself. You're just the universe understanding itself. Aristotle would have loved that, right? You're really, you really are a part of the universe for Aristotle. Aristotle doesn't have time for the kind of um, dualism of Plato. Dualism means two, right? For Plato, you're kind of divided. You have one foot in the physical world of changing, blooming, blooming, buzzing confusion, and one foot in the form world. You have your sense life and your intellectual life, and they're kind of divorced for Plato. No, for Aristotle, you're an animal in the material universe. But you're an animal in the material universe that is bringing the universe back in on itself. You are the universe reflecting and cognizing itself. You don't have some extra separate existence for Aristotle. You don't have some real home that's in some platonic heaven. No, for Aristotle, your soul, your soul's place, um, so to speak, is here and now, in your life, in your physical, material, human, animal life. I'll jump ahead a little bit in our history of philosophy and tell you that by the 13th century, this theory of the soul uh, had found a very popular place in Christianity. Don't think that Aristotle's theory of the soul must be at odds with Christianity. No, no. Consider somebody like St. Thomas Aquinas, a guy I'll have quite a bit to say about um, in a future lecture. Aquinas um, bought Aristotle's theory of the soul full on, right? Aquinas realized that for Aristotle, to talk about the soul is really to talk about life activities. This is what Aristotle's trying to do. He's trying to explain substances, living substances, in terms of their life activities. 
To talk about your soul, to talk about your human soul, is to talk about your human activity. Aristotle notes, of course, Aristotle is going to remind us that form is always the form of a material substance in our universe. Everything we talk about in our universe is a substance made up of matter and form. It's not substances trying to imitate some perfect form. It's matter organized a certain way to perform certain activities. So Aristotle will say things like, if the eyeball had its own soul, it doesn't because it's just a part of our bodies, but if the eyeball somehow had its own soul, its soul would be seeing. He says things like this, if an axe, like a battle axe, if an axe were a living thing, it's not of course, but if an axe were a living thing, we would say its soul is cutting, right? The form of an axe is what makes the wood and the metal and all that cut stuff, so the soul of an axe would be cut. Okay, so the form of a, the soul of a bird, you might say the soul of a bird, is its material organization to fly. And when you kill the bird, well, since, uh, you know, you can't have flying if you don't have a body that's flying, right? Something that's, that's not physical can't fly. Well, when its body decays, there's no more form, because the form is how matter is organized. You can't talk about the organization of the matter separate from the matter. Well, you can talk about it, I guess. I mean, I can talk about the, the geometric properties of a, of a square, um, wooden square, or a, I can talk about the geometrical properties of a, of a circle, regardless of what kind of matter it's made of. Um, I can talk about the form separate from the matter, but the form, it makes no sense to think of the form as really existing separately from the matter. It no, makes no sense to think of flying separate from a thing that flies, separate from some flying bird. So the bird's soul is flight. Mr. Whiskers' soul is meow, 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 and purr, purr, purr. And when Mr. Whiskers dies, there will be other cats still meowing and purring, but Mr. Whiskers' meow, 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 and purr, purr, purr is gone forever. Why? because Mr. Whiskers' meow, 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 purr, purr, purr organs will have turned into dust. And if her meow, 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 purr, purr, purr organs, whatever the organs are within a cat that makes the purring and meowing noises, if they're dirt, they can't meow and purr anymore. So Mr. Whiskers, she has a kitty cat soul. That's what lets her meow, 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 purr, purr, purr. She's organized to do that. But when she dies, there's no more Mr. Whiskers' soul. Human beings, what's our activity? It's the scientific one. It's the one where the universe is able to reflect back on itself. Aristotle does raise this possibility. He says that if it turns out that this ability that we have um, to, or to think about the universe, um, if it does not reside in some bit of matter, the way sight resides in the eye, so to speak, um, the way um, hearing resides in the ears, so to speak, if our rational comprehension of the universe doesn't reside in matter, well then, it's possible, says Aristotle, it's at least possible that after you kill me and my body turns into worm food, um, well, it's possible that my rational intellect, that aspect of my soul, so to speak, could have an independent existence. You might think Aristotle is here um, um, hinting at the possibility of what we would now call the immortality of the soul. This is a, as close as Aristotle will ever get to um, supernatural talk of souls. He simply gestures towards the possibility that if um, our, our rational ability, if our, our rational activity, our intellectual operations, our scientific um, thinking about the universe, the way we organize it, um, the way we, we, we um, uh, uh, make models out of it, the way we, we try to compare things within it abstractly, right? We, we form abstract notions like mercy is greater than justice, right? This is totally abstract. Um, our ability to do that, thinks Aristotle, um, if it turns out that you can't explain that in terms of a physical process, 
the way, for example, you explain how sight is possible when light comes through the eye and things like that. If you can't explain our scientific abilities physically, well then, that aspect of how we're organized, that bit of our soul, could have existence independently of our bodies. Now, some later people, like Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, he would try to argue that that's exactly the case, that uh, um, our soul um, uh, makes us think, our soul is just our scientific thinking, our scientific thinking cannot be reduced to the operation of a material organ, therefore, that aspect of our soul um, can um, continue to exist even after your body dies. Notice that on this way of thinking, this does not mean that you exist after you die. No, not at all. Uh, because you are what? You're composed of matter and form. So the fact that your form, your thinking, might have some independent existence after your body turns into worm food, well, that's not you. That soul, that bit of soul, um, it, it's really loose speech here, by the way. I, I talk about the parts of a soul, even though the soul has no material parts. And maybe it's better to talk about the aspect, that aspect of the soul, which allows human beings to not only grow and reproduce and run away and, and have sense uh, perception, but also that aspect of the soul whereby we're rational, what distinguishes us as the rational animal, um, that aspect of the soul, um, if it continues to exist, it's not you. It's just not you. You are an animal. You are a body. You're a body organized a certain way, no doubt about that for Aristotle, but if your body turns into worm food, there is no more you, even if that thinking part of you somehow has a non-material, independent existence. So, for Aristotle, we distinguish the world according to form. It's a material world, through and through. The world, the universe, is physical, but its physical stuff, its matter, is organized in different ways. And so, organization must be real. Form is real. It's not physically real. It's not a material thing, but the organization of a thing is a real aspect of the thing. I am not just quarks and superstrings and stuff studied in particle physics. No, I'm that stuff organized, formed a certain way. And if I'm that stuff formed a certain way, if that's a true statement, well then form must be real. Again, remember for Aristotle, these are not platonic forms. Form on Aristotle's account is more of, it has to do with how something gets organized. I've even seen some texts translate Aristotelian form with the word shape. That's not a great translation, but what they're getting at, right, is, is the idea that um, you, could take, you could take some matter and, and form it into a ball or into a cube uh, um, or into a, a rubber stamp things like that, right? I, I could take rubber. I could take rubber and organize it into a basketball or into a, a stamp, like, like they use in the post office, perhaps. That's why they use shape sometimes. Well, I don't think shape's a good translation. I, I, I prefer to stick with form. Um, but for Aristotle, the student of Plato, who was the student of Socrates, for Aristotle, form is really a part, not a physical part. You might want to call it a metaphysical part, but form is a real part of who you are. It's as real as your matter. Why? Because your matter would not be you if it were not formed to be you. Just like there can be no form of you unless it's forming some matter to be you. That's something to think about, all right? Make sure you really understand that, okay? Um, um, your matter cannot be you, the physical stuff that's, you know, all the cells and atoms and strings and quarks and leptons and all that stuff. That stuff cannot be you until it gets organized and formed into you. Trust me, if it gets scattered all over the planet or all over the universe, you're dead. That's terrible. You don't want that to happen, okay? Matter has to get organized and formed into you. Your form, your soul, on Aristotle's way of speaking, also can be nothing at all 
until it forms some matter into you. So these are two essential parts. There's a fancy philosophy way of speaking. See if you can figure out what it means to speak of essential parts. You have two essential parts. One physical, your matter. One metaphysical, your soul. That is to say, there's the physical stuff which can be moved and turned into other people. And then there's the organization of your physical stuff which makes your physical stuff a thinking, speaking, breathing human being. Okay, applying matter and form to living things, and especially to human living things, um, it's a little tricky. Some people find it, you know, it, this is a hard lecture to think about. I really, really recommend you think about this lecture quite a bit. If you're writing a paper for this class on... Um, philosophy of mind, or on personal identity, or on how individual people endure over time, or any topics like that, I definitely recommend watching this lecture at least one more time, if not a couple more times. Uh, um, really get yourself clear on A, why Aristotle thinks we distinguish things by their form. B, with that in mind, you want to make sure you understand that Aristotle really does think that living things are distinct from non-living things. If they're really distinct, and since we distinguish things by form, we should be able to name the form of living things. Aristotle named it suke. In English, we just use the word soul. So, all living things have souls on Aristotle's account. Right away, you can see we have to jettison any spooky, supernatural the uh, image you have of the soul. That's not what's going on here. We're just talking about the Aristotelian organization, the Aristotelian form of living things. Living things also get distinguished from each other based on the kind of living soul they have, the kind of living organization. Some things live in such a way that all they do is grow and reproduce. That's plants. Some things live in such a way that they also have sensation and locomotion. We call those animals. Some things live in such a way that they also, in addition to sensing, perceiving, uh, 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 reproducing, uh, taking in nutrition, some things also have the rational capacity, the ability to abstractly internalize the entire universe in a scientific way. We're just organized to be able to do that. And if it's the case that our doing that is not the result of some material organ, some material part of us being formed to do that, well, then Aristotle thinks it's just possible that we might have an existence, uh, um, a part of us might have an existence, a metaphysical part of us might have an existence even after the body dies. But it's not you, because you are essentially composed of matter and form. Okay, make sure you understand those last five points. Watch the lecture again. Talk to your friends about it. See if you can put it all into your own words. I used a metaphor of a, a, a cafeteria kitchen. Maybe you can find a better one. See if you can think of a better way of making the chart for Arist Aristotle's theory of matter and form. It's not that complicated, really, at, at the, especially at this stage, but you do want to think about it a bit. I didn't really understand it until I had thought about it for at least probably 20 hours. I think I put a good 20 hours at least into thinking about Aristotle's theory of life, which he writes in a book called De Anima. Um, I had to really think about that text really hard to be able to get all this clear. Uh, but I hope I've gotten it clear enough for you to be able to understand it. Think about it a bit. Send me questions. Come meet with me. I'm sure you can get it. Talk to you soon.